Crashers, in this video we'll be discussing what I call the prehistory of comics. Now, I'm not so sure as some other historians that the art objects we'll be talking about today are really comics, check out episode 1, but the artists creating these works are grappling with some of the same theoretical concerns and using similar formal techniques that comic artists still use today. And many of these art forms influence the creation of comics as a form, so they're pretty important to our beloved medium's history. In short, this video focuses on early visual art that uses space to represent and manipulate the passage of time in comic-y ways. So there's actually an influential theory of art that says that visual arts shouldn't do this. It's called the theory of the sister arts. This notion actually goes back to classical philosophy, but finds its most famous iteration in Gertold Lessing's 1767 book, Lo Koan, an essay on the limits of painting and poetry. Now Lessing outlines a commonly held belief you'll still hear it sometimes today, that literature, or poetry, is an art of time. It unfolds as we read it, in our mind, requiring the passage of time. Painting, or sculpture, on the other hand, is an art of space. Sure, we react in time, but visual art's primary meaning exists in its material, spatial existence, no matter how much time we take to encounter it. For Lessing, the best examples of each type of art take advantage of their inherent connections to time or space, and only poorer examples of art try to blur these boundaries. As you can probably tell, I don't buy into the sister arts theory very much. The moment it's written down, literature requires space. And many writers actively manipulate the spatial dimensions of words, phrases, pages, and books as part of their literary goal. Likewise, visual art necessarily requires time to understand and interpret it. And in comics, well, space is time. Each panel is a unit of the narrative, and time passes as we move within and between panels, as we move in space. We'll discuss panels another time, properly. This video is about the old stuff. And I mean, the really old stuff. Because even if we narrow our scope to visual art that shows the passage of time across space, we have to go back to the very beginning, when humans picked up burnt sticks and started to scribble on walls. And at some level, this makes sense, that we have to go back this far, because stories require change, and change requires time passing. So these images in the Chauvet Caves are fascinating precisely because of what we don't know about them, whether there are multiple scenes, like some pieces we'll see later, or one big hunt. But the one thing we do see are these moments that try to portray motion and movement. And before film, before animation tricks like zoetropes, our ancestors had to figure out how to show time changing with still images. And what that often meant was presenting multiple scenes in a single space. So check out these images, over 32,000 years old. Now, our ancestors didn't think that horses had five heads or bison had eight legs. We can see from other images in the caves, for example, that they knew how to draw bison and lion and horses and antelope. So what's going on? Well, some scientists theorize that in the flickering light of an evening fire, these multiple-headed or repeated figures, well, they created a primitive kind of animation. And that's kind of beautiful to think about. But even if that's not true, those extra limbs imply motion. And it's a trick that artists still use today. For example, in this cover of The Flash. So if we jump ahead an odd 20,000 years, in ancient Egypt and Rome, artists still tried to tell stories across space using pictures. Take, for example, the tomb of Mena. There's a royal official whose tomb in the Theban necropolis dates from somewhere around 1400 to 1350 BCE. If you were to stand in the center of the main chamber and look around, you could follow the daily activities of Mena and his family, as well as that of his workers. About 1,500 years later, in ancient Rome, the artisans chose to make you walk around their piece in a different way. You had to walk up Trajan's Column, which was built to commemorate a Roman victory in the Dacian Wars. It's 98 feet high, it's 12 feet in diameter, and if you follow it from the bottom to the top, you get to witness Trajan's victory over the course of 620 feet of marble frieze. Well, you used to. They've long since taken away the stair spiral staircase to preserve the sculpture. In Eastern Asia, they did it a slightly different way. The practice of painting illustrated hand scrolls became popular around the first century AD. 
You would unscroll about an arm's length at a time, reading from right to left. Sometimes these scrolls were only images, but often there was language involved, like in this early Chinese example, Admonitions for the Court Instructress by Gu Kaiji. Each section is an illustration accompanied with a short section of text. In Japan, this picture book format would evolve into the emakimono, a long scroll that combined a section of text with a section of illustration. Perhaps the most famous of these is the Genji Monogatari Imaki, created somewhere between 1120 and 1140 CE, and based on one of the world's first novels, The Tale of Genji, which, by the way, happened to be written by a woman, Murasaki Shikibu. Challenging the Genji Imaki for the most famous Japanese picture scroll is the Choju Jinbutsu Giga, or the Frolicking Animal Scroll. Now, unlike the previous two examples, this is entirely pictorial. But due in part to its insanely charming cast of anthropomorphic animals, historians have argued this scroll might be the first manga. And other scholars and historians connect it to the sort of kawaii aesthetic, uh, the super cute look that continues in popular brands like Sanrio today. Across the Pacific and Central America, Mesoamerican cultures were creating their own proto-comic type art well before the Spanish invasion. We found evidence on wall paintings like the ancient Egyptians and in their versions of books called codices. In this section of the Mayan Toronto Codex, the smaller figures you see with thick outlines might look like pictures, but they're actually hieroglyphic language. It's the bigger images in the center that are illustrations. Here's another example from the Mixtec Codex Anyute. Like the previous codex, it mixes text captions with illustrations. Back across the Atlantic again, we return to an example from episode one, the Bayou Tapestry. Created in 1080 CE to commemorate the Battle of Hastings, the 230 foot long tapestry is in some ways very similar to Trajan's Column. This one's just a little easier to fit in your house or castle. The tapestry also includes captions above each scene. What I find really interesting about the last few examples is that it shows us all around the world, in at least Asia, Africa, the Americas, and Europe, different cultures were coming to similar conclusions about how to show the passage of time using space, by presenting multiple scenes in one image across large or long spaces. However, this form seemed to fall out of favor, especially in Europe, and even eventually in Asia, when visual art seemed to be dominated by single scenes represented on single panels, boards, or canvases. Which brings me to my final category, an exception to that rule. Paintings called composite paintings or continuous narratives. They seem to have some short-lived popularity in the European Renaissance. Now these paintings are different than say a Bruegel's or a Hieronymus Bosch, whose busy images featured lots of characters and tons of detail, but were meant to understand that everything was happening at the same time. In these composite paintings, artists chose to show multiple scenes from one story on the same canvas. So, for example, in this piece from Duccio's Maestra Padella panels, Jesus heals the man, and then the man turns away. We're not supposed to think that there are two blind men who have been healed, or are being healed, but to understand that these are two separate moments of the same story. Here's another example from Masaccio which tells a story from the Gospel of St. Matthew in which Peter finds the money to pay a temple tax in the mouth of the fish. Three scenes, one painting. It's around this time that we begin to overlap with what's called print culture, where comics are really born. So, mostly going to stop for today. Now you might notice that I've skipped over the illuminated manuscripts of the Middle Ages, in part because they address a whole different set of issues. The relationship between word and image. So we're stopping here for now, but really, we're just getting started. See you next time.